I was a teenager when I saw Harold Lloyd for the first time, and I was absolutely impressed with what a great comic he was. And they ran all these beautiful 35 millimeter copies. I'd never seen silent pictures look so good. It's amazing, his films will drive an audience into a laugh riot. I really came into contact with him kind of as public, kind of growing up, because the compilation series he's made, he, he made of just clips from films, were around in, in the 60s, so I, I, I saw those. So I began to get to know Harold Lloyd really as a man who made feature films and uh, very highly evolved, and so I knew that he was not just about stunts, but he was uh, highly ingenious and very uh, interested in plot and in character and, um, and sometimes even period. Um, so um, I ended up writing three complete scores, but it, and always in a very unique way. When I was given the assignment to produce music for the Harold Lloyd comedies, uh, Sue said to me, Robert, you realize there are about 20 or so pictures that have to be done, you're going to go crazy. Before 1920, there were theaters that uh, were maybe not as opulently designed and quite as plush as during the 20s, the movie Palace. If, if they bothered with music at all, uh, bothered with printed music and didn't just improvise, um, that probably it was out of the libraries. And popular songs of the day. In those days, uh, producers rarely worked with composers. They were under the uh, practice that the music directors at these theaters were competent enough to provide proper music and effective music for these presentations. And in fact, this was true. So it was basically a given that in the best theaters, they would get the best music. And you could not control what went on in a small theater in, say, for example, Des Moines, Iowa, in a real tiny street where Mary Jane from the church is tinkling away. The first one I did, which was the big challenge, was, was called Safety Last, which probably of all his films provides the one lasting image that everybody knows. If you say Harold Lloyd and they know who you're talking about, they will be thinking of the man who is dangling from the clock at the climactic moment in uh, Safety Last. The film was made in the middle of the 20s, and the middle of the 20s was a very important musical premiere, which was George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. What if I draw, drew a parallel between the Jazz Age, which was, you know, uh, which was the 1920s, Harold Lloyd being contemporary always to his own time. If he makes a film in 1925, it's set in 1925. He always is dead center of the period he's living in. And the sound should be of the most successful jazz band of the time, the, mo the grandest, biggest. These films are all very different from each other, so they did lend for me inspiration in terms of what are you going to do? Grandma's Boy is a bucolic rural setting and is very different from For Heaven's Sake, which is a mid-twenties city picture, uh, much more of, uh, of that time. And the five years uh, difference between 1920 and 1925 is a world of difference. Grandma's Boy came from 1922, but in three years, the amount of growth in Lloyd's productions is astonishing. The Freshman, a college picture, completely different from the others. Hot Water, a complete gag-driven comedy of one of the funniest setups you've ever seen, commenting on domestic life. They're all different. Why Worry takes place in South America during a revolution in a town. Beautiful setting. So it was as a composer's dream to really have a big cornucopia of uh, things to choose from. When I did these, which was, which was I think, the first two were in the 1980s, and then uh, Speedy was a bit later. Um, you know, you had to think of them for today, in a way. You, you, you know, they were going to be fresh. It wasn't a revival. The thing about new scores for these silence is that 
the listening experience of the broad population of filmgoers um, is much greater today. If you think when these films were made, I mean, it was the beginning of radio, it was the beginning of gramophone. You know, it was a, it was a big deal to have one. In the in the 1920s, when these when these were made, I mean, it, there still was a great deal of home music making. People learned to play. Uh, instruments, people played them at home. And though there was the beginnings of radio and the beginnings of gramophone, it basically was still about it. You made the music, you played it. stuff happens with me sitting on the floor looking at the TV set, watching a silent film completely silent without any kind of music, and trying to imagine what is going to fit, what's going to work. Uh, the equation is often pretty simple. You would not open up a film like Girl Shy with something dramatic like that. I mean, that's ridiculous. Why would you open a comedy film like that? And yet I've heard really ridiculous scores. And I think that any moviegoer has. If, if it is in the middle of a scene, it, it's vital that the music goes on, that it does it, that it, in one sense, ignore, can't ignore the meaning of what's said, but doesn't stop for it. It, it, it must carry you in, a fr in its phrasing across those titles. Because sometimes, very often, you, you, you see uh, the character who's speaking begin the speed, maybe the first words of what's coming up, it's interrupted by the card, you cut back to the character who's finishing the statement. So you kind of have to compose for the thought of it rather than, and, and go through it all so that the, the um, viewer is not, is not distracted by an interruption but is continuing through the longer thought. This is a sequence from For Heaven's Sake. Harold Lloyd has been thrown out of this pool hall he wants to get these people to the mission because they could use some spiritual nourishment. And looking at this, a chase begins. And right here is where it changes. The rhythm changes and it's what I was talking about before regarding comedy film and catching some of these gags. To continue having just some kind of lively music playing through this scene destroys the gag here. The whole point is this guy's being beat up and is constantly turning the wrong way. What I did for that sequence is every time Harold Lloyd kicks the guy tying his shoe, I use a bass drum. Then there's a little oboe solo, and then the guy turns around and pops the guy, and I use a wood block for the crunch on the jaw. Harold Lloyd comes back, bass drum, another oboe solo, wood block, and then Noah, Noah Young kicks bass drum, and then the music starts up again. Without catching that break in rhythm, the gag doesn't come off nearly as great as it is. I mean, the range of percussion instruments is enormous, you know, I mean, going through every different culture on earth. My favorite one is in Safety Last, is poor Harold's up on a ledge. And uh, he comes upon a little family who are having a little picnic and they're eating peanuts, you see, and they leave the shells around. And as soon as this family go, uh, and Harold starts climbing, climbing again, he's a, a great flock of pigeons come along to pick up the remnants of this little peanut picnic. And he's absolutely desperate until he discovers the paper bag that <laughs> the peanuts had been bought in, had been held in, and he blows up the little paper bag and bangs it against the sill, and the bang disperses the pigeons. Now the question of the sound of the, of the bag is, is really very important, and I have uh, actually worked with percussionists who go out shopping for the right kind of paper bag, and, and actually try them out. I said, do you prefer the brown paper bag? <laughs> Boom. You know, no, here's, here's the white, rather waxy paper bag, you know. Not so I said, well, you know, and so there are people who take this very, very seriously. The Freshman is a picture that posed incredibly unique problems. For example, a real difficult moment to score. He does this jig when he meets somebody. He shows his father, and it is the most ridiculous thing you've ever seen. It is very funny. What am I going to play for a jig? What am I going to use? 
And some people uh, thought, well, you could use Irish washerwoman, you know, the... Um... But that doesn't quite work. Someone uh, was thinking maybe Pop Goes a Weasel, and that could work. Uh, from my point of view, I preferred something a little bit less... Um, a little bit less well-known on one level, and yet very well-known. If that makes any sense at all, what I came up with was... And I think when you look at the image, I think that that's probably the best choice for him. And in fact, was able to compose a variation on that in which he's meeting a lot of people, and he's doing this jig over and over and over. Uh, you've got this... Uh... It fits every time he does this jig for everybody. And it's a good way to make a variation. Well, the, the interesting thing about them is, is that um, they are pre-depression. The, these films are all made before 1929. And, uh, and they have this atmosphere of optimism about them. Um, there, there doesn't seem to be a limit, but of course, uh, by the time you get, you get uh, past the, the depression of 1929 and on into the 30s, filmmaking does become very, very different uh, in tone. And we, we're still part of this sort of bubble that will never burst. Uh, and the music always has to support it. The music has to go with the film. Um, and, and so you, you find yourself writing a lot of continuously energetic music. People often view the term silent film as pejorative, which is a mistake. I mean, as Peter Bogdanovich said, they're not old films. They're just films you haven't seen before waiting to be looked at. Silent pictures were never silent. It's a misnomer. They were never called silent films in their days. They were movies. They were film, cinema. Uh, they always had music. When we come to Lloyd, we come to a man who is comfortable in his own time. He very much wants to be part of society. He very much wants to succeed. He wants to make money. He wants status in society and so on. And the films are very much about um, a kind of coming of age, becoming a man, assuming responsibilities about marriage, about property, about a good job, all these things. He really is sort of mi middle America, and this resonance is still uh, very, uh, very, very strong. By the end of the Harold Lloyd project, I recorded nearly 14 hours of music, which is an enormous amount. If you were to break it down into half-hour segments, that's about 28 symphonies by Mozart. And it's a lot of music. But what I'm proud about most is that the musicians I worked with, both in Los Angeles and primarily in the Czech Republic, were very enthusiastic and really wanted to play their absolute best. What I learned was that Lloyd made terrific feature films. Uh, very coherent stories, very evolved, very interesting uh, characters, and very interesting situations. And not all of it are stunts. I mean, eventually, inevitably, there are incredible stunts in them, and generally at their climaxes, something really amazing. <laughs> If there was an afterlife and I could meet Harold Lloyd, what would I say to him? I first would have to be in awe of him, and yet my understanding he was a very modest man. But I think because of that modesty, I'd simply say to him, thank you for leaving a legacy of some of the most beautiful, funny, and brilliant films ever made. Mm -hmm.